Hey, thanks so much for listening to the Ridge Community Church Podcast. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors on staff at the Ridge, and our vision is to bring the hope of Jesus into every home. So as a piece of that, our goal each week is to bring you something that's hopeful and helpful. So subscribe to this podcast to make sure you don't miss any hopeful and helpful conversations. Hey everyone, and thanks for listening to this episode of the Ridge Podcast. If you find today's episode hopeful and helpful, then please follow or subscribe, and then rate and review so that more people can find the conversation. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to give us a follow and turn on your notifications. As a church, we've been going through a series called Relationships on Purpose. and We've been talking a lot about the importance of having a plan with the relationships in our lives. And this last weekend, the lead pastor of the Ridge, Mark White, shared a message on parenting. There is just so much to talk about on this topic that not only are we doing a follow-up podcast, but this is going to be a two-parter. In this first part of the conversation, Mark shares on the impact of having a goal statement as a parent, how to deal with the feelings of pressure from other parents, and how you can make an impact on the faith of your child. This is part one of my conversation with Mark. Hey, Mark, thanks for coming on the Ridge Podcast. As always, you couldn't get anyone else, so you go to me. <laughs> Okay. So we're talking about parenting, right? And I have to ask you, I have some friends, new parents, and they kind of describe that they have this moment where they're like, oh, wow, I am, I am in charge of this human being's life. Was there, what was that moment like for you? Oh man. I think every parent when they first become one remembers that moment. And then it's like, the moment doesn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> At least for 18 years, 18 years, yeah. 19 years. Yeah. And it's like, God, why did you do it this way again? Why would you entrust yeah. us? It's kind of crazy. And uh, it's awe-inspiring and cool and scary. And fe- it's just, there's just so much wrapped into it. But man, just the deep sense of, and I, I was talking to a new set of parents the other day. And I said, how did you feel? when you met your son for the first time and they were like, I didn't think I could love someone that much, but I, it was amazing. And it's like, that's the cool part of it. That's awesome. Do you feel like there's this like instant, do you like there's an instant change that happens within you in terms of like priorities and things like that? Or is that more like you have to consciously make that switch? I don't, I think there's a, I think some, some of us do it well and some of us don't do it well as far as that shift is concerned, because it's, it's like if you get married, uh, you know, you're single and you're living your life. All of a sudden you get married and you're like, Oh, I, I can't just, and I I have to, and I have to be concerned with someone else. And then you put a kid in there, uh, at least with your spouse, there's okay. You you can live on, you, you don't need me to make all your decisions, but with a kid, it's like, they're completely dependent on you. And that is a whole new experience. It really is. That's wild. I mean, so we've uh, we've been going through this this series, Relationships on Purpose, which has been really cool, I think, as we just dive into like, hey, what does it look like to have a plan for some of the relationships in mm-hmm. our life that happen on accident, right? And uh, if you just gave a talk on, on parenting, and if anybody hasn't listened to that yet, I'd highly encourage, give it a watch, give it a listen. You can do that on this podcast or on YouTube. Um, but really quickly... Uh, you know, you mentioned kind of the big, one of the big premises was that you need to have a mission statement, a goal statement for parenting. Would you kind of give us a quick little like overview, quick recap of, of what you meant by that and why that's important? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of, of reason why it's important. And then I'll just dig into a little bit more. For parenting, we were fortunate enough, and I don't know why, I think we fell into this by accident, but someone had asked us the question that we were asking in the series, and it's like, hey, what's your plan for parenting? And we're like, oh, Donna, like, well, we're just going to have kids, and and uh, <laughs> then we're going to start raising them, and and you know, you just because you, you want to be a mom or you want to be a dad, and it's such a cool calling and just all that stuff that in the midst of that, it's kind of like with most couples when, you, when they're engaged and you're planning for the wedding, uh, I've learned this, don't give them a whole lot of advice because they aren't going to listen to you anyways. They're just concerned about getting wet, getting married, and and uh, you hope to just kind of develop the trust enough that when things then when they struggle that they can reach back to you. It's kind of that that idea. But with parenting, we were just like we got asked that question a couple of times, and we finally said, "Man, we we like most people who aren't parents. They look at other people's parenting and then they judge them. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they do. Like I would never <laughs> do that. You know, we all and that yet we've never been a parent, but yet we do it anyways." 
And we just finally said, what are we, what is our plan? And we're like, I don't know. And so we just started asking people that we saw had great, we're raising great kids, godly kids. And then we just sat down with them and started to have conversation. And we started to just ask them things like, um, Hey, what is your goal as a parent? What do you hope to do? How do you discipline? How do you make those decisions? How do you handle conflict? All that stuff. We just started asking questions. And so we realized that one of the the main things we saw over and over again was uh, parents that were consistently raising good kids that we had talked to, they created a goal statement. Mm. And it was like, huh, that kind of makes sense. And uh, and so that was really the genesis behind the whole thing. We fell into it by accident. Otherwise, what ends up happening is we have kids and then we just start reacting mm. and responding. And we may do some research on, hey, when they're babies, this and babies that. Okay. But then when they're not babies, we then usually will default to what we know or what we see. And, uh, and then you get to a certain age and culture starts to swing in there. And then you just start responding and reacting. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to get ahead of that. And that was the reason and the reasons behind the goal statement. I think that's, I think that's really powerful. I think, you know, we've discovered this and just like all phases of whether it's uh, leadership or whether it's decision-making, if you don't know clearly why you're making a decision, you're going to end up in the wrong area, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, and I think that when I was listening to your message and hearing that goal statement segment, um, it's just so clear that it's like, okay, now you can have an effective filter for how do you make decisions, especially when you have two, like maybe they're equally good or maybe they're like equally challenging decisions and you have to pick one. Um, how do you do that? And uh, it just seems like there's a lot of clarity that comes from that. Yeah. And there's, and, and it's getting harder where uh, there's just so much being thrown at us as parents. It's just so much. And it's so challenging where it, you just, you find yourself in re- reactive mode all the time mm-hmm. and pressure mode and fear of missing out mode and all that stuff that this really allows you to get ahead of that. And I think John, one of the things it did for Donna and I is because we started with the end in mind, it allowed us to go, how are we going to discipline now based on that? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? How are we going to make decisions based on uh, how we spend time with them, when we spend time, what are the key times, uh, just all that stuff. It, it just created all sorts of conversation where this was really, really fascinating. And this people would say, well, that's because you're a pastor. No, it was because we really uh, had these conversations. Donna and I hardly ever argued about discipline. Hmm. We hardly ever did because we aligned ourselves before the things happened. And, uh, and it just allowed for such, okay, nope, this is it. We've decided on this based on this. And it just, we, we just didn't argue about it. And we were consistent with the kids as a result. So this question is not coming from a place of like shame for anyone or anything like that. But mm-hmm. some people work under a, just a little bit more of a go at, go along with the flow and I don't want to be extra structured and things like that mentality, yeah. maybe just with life in general. And I'm sure that, that extends to parenting. Would you have any uh, encouragement or thoughts for them? Uh, yeah, this is, this is not taking away from your personality. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, when you create a good God honoring goal statement, it actually gives you the fence that you can play within that will actually give you more freedom uh, rather than uh, a lot of times we say, well, I'm kind of a go with the flow. Well, that's excuse for just doing whatever you want to do. That's what that's code for. A lot of times I've done, it. I get it. Okay. It is. Uh, but boundaries create freedom, not no boundaries, boundaries create freedom. And so what the goal, the goal does is it creates freedom and it gives you the clear boundaries to play within, which honestly, that's where the fun is. That's where the fun is. So would you mind sharing you and Donna's goal and maybe how you came up with it? That way, as as uh, parents are listening in, they're like, oh, we want one. And maybe we want to, they want to steal yours or maybe mm-hmm. they want to create their own tweaked version of that. But. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <sighs> Man, you're talking us to go way back in time, you know, in the beginning <laughs> of need. So we, um, we just sat down and we said, uh, what's important to us uh, as parents? What do we feel, you know, as Jesus followers, what do, what do we feel like, you know, if God has entrusted us with however many kids we were going to have at the time, we didn't know. 
uh, what is important to us? Cause it's important to God. And then um, what do we feel like is going to be important to them? And we just, we just took those two ideas and we brought those together. Well, you know what? Um, God's entrusted us with them. So we want to create environments where our kids know Jesus. And that's where, Hey, we raise our kids to follow Jesus. And that is, we're not forcing them to follow Jesus. We're going to create an environment and environments and what we do and how we live that they're going to be able to make that decision on their own. Yeah. And then the other part is uh, we've just seen a lot happen and I remember this was me when I was going to college is I wasn't fully ready to leave home from the standpoint. I didn't feel equipped on certain things. And we just said, no, we raise them to release them. Mm. Let's, let's start with that in mind right away and empowering them. So when they step out on their own, they feel as, as well prepared as they can be. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't want to throw culture under the bus because I think sometimes we, we love to say, well, culture says, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but I think culture does say a lot of times things that can be counter to those uh, principles, maybe not the second one so much as the first one, um, or, you know, different things of life, whether it's a, a coach on a sports team or um, a different parent, like they're going to have a different, their own version for what the priorities of your kid should be. Mm-hmm. How do you def- uh, keep or defend the goal statement? Well, um, I, yeah, I'm okay. If, if someone's not following Jesus, I, I mean, let their first part be whatever they want their first part to be. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. And um, that's that I don't disagree with that. I, well, I don't want them to sign up for something. I'm not going to encourage them to sign up for something that they're not already signed up for. Okay. But if you're a Jesus follower, you got to take a hard look and go, man, those kids are a gift from God. We're called to steward them. What a cool opportunity and calling that God's given us. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we, how do we, I don't, I don't, I don't defend that. All right. Because I'd ever feel the need to. Yeah. And if someone did say, well, you know, I think, I think this, I think that as parents in a very loving, kind uh, way, I, honestly, I'm not responsible for what other people think. I'm, I'm responsible for raising our kids in a way that honors God. And yeah. sometimes, and this is the hard thing is I know that our position on that point is the minority position. Yeah. Uh, but leaders and, and as parents, we're leaders, we're leading our family that takes courage and it always takes courage. And we got to step into that and that allows us to step into God more. So there's a courageous aspect of that. That is part of it. Yeah. And You know, it's so interesting because I think that that's something where um, then it becomes the idea like your number one priority isn't to be a parent that other parents think is doing a good job. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like that's not the number one priority. Like, you know, hopefully there's some parents that maybe think that along the way, (laughs) but that's not the top decision maker. You know, what's funny is we talk about peer pressure with, with kids in middle school and high school and they, I, we never talk about the peer pressure of parents. On parents. <laughs> and honestly, that's what's driving most of the stuff we see right now going on that's that's hurting kids to some degree as, as research and stuff is coming out. And it's not it it all has to do with the pressure that parents are feeling. And that's a real pressure and it's hard. It really is. It's a real challenge. Yeah, I have some I have some friends and they're they were sharing with me one of the most unexpected things of of being a parent was feeling as though when they shared their parenting decisions, that they would be essentially judged shamed. by yeah, shamed. shamed, yeah, mm-hmm. by other parents who had just made different decisions, and sometimes they're just different preferences, you know. And I think that this is maybe a tiny little baby side note, but if you're a parent, uh, maybe consider your how you interact with other parents when they share what decisions they've made, but. Yeah. You know, one of the things, John, I think is really tough as parents to do, and I touched on it just briefly in the message, and I and I, I could have done a whole another week on this or two weeks on this, is we talk about all these things that we're seeing in this generation right now that, that are just really, really challenging as far as mental health and suicide, all this stuff, okay? And, and we just see them detach more and all that. And yet, we don't hit the pause button and go, what's causing that? And little do we know, many of the very common trends that have become normal in parenting are driving those very things. Mm. And so to be able to take a look at that as a parent and have the courage to go, hey, wait a minute, we're being judged for 
doing things that are actually facilitating things that are hurting our kids, uh, that's that's a real challenge. And most parents, they don't do that because of the peer pressure. What's the discovery process for that look like? Is that reading a book? Is that talking to trusted parents? Is that asking hard questions? What does that look like? Well, man, there's a lot of stuff coming out now in uh, in things. I, in fact, I just was reading a book. Uh, it, it's called uh, The Anxious Generation by John Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, The Anxious Generation. bunch of research is just coming out now uh, just regarding the activity activity level technology stuff and all that, and how that's impacting the mental health stuff of kids. And just the research is unbelievable. Mm. And uh, there's a lot of other stuff that is just coming out. I was talking to a, a counselor uh, just about what was going on. And he was talking about how now they have, they have a bunch of research out on just the technology use in with kids. They can actually see now their brains are physically shrinking due to wow. it. And so there's all this now, because now we have time under our belt now where they can yeah. the trends and all that. And, but no one stops and goes, what are some of the things? Now, it's not the only thing, but what are some of these things that are driving these statistics to rise? And as a parent, we got to stop and hit the pause button and go, what is that? Because I'm not just going to be an exception necessarily. Mm. It's just a hard thing to do. But as a parent, I think that's part of our calling now. And as we parent in this really, really tough times. That's really good. I mean, you, uh, so you mentioned in message, uh, this idea of one of the ways that you can help raise your child to be a follower of Jesus is by modeling faith to them. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make that a priority? Especially if, you know, someone is in maybe newer in their faith journey. Maybe they just, maybe they just made a decision to follow Jesus last month and they want to start implementing that and modeling that. How do they do that? Yeah. It's, it looks different based on the age of your kids. All sure. right. But if you look at some overarching principles, John, is it doesn't matter if you're beginning or, or farther along, all right? What does matter is that your kids see you taking steps and they don't expect perfection. In fact, I said this the message, this, this generation hates fake, which I think is cool. Yeah. All right. So that means we can just be honest about the struggles and all that stuff. I found with my kids, when I shared with them the challenges and struggles that I've had with faith and, and during times... And that's the time that they leaned in the most. And because they were like, oh, so you're not a robot and you get it. You know, so it was it was that sort of thing. All right. <laughs> yeah. And I and I just, you know, once again, just what is the next step and take it? Communicate that with your kids. Let them see that like anything, you know what someone's priority is based on where they spend their time. Mm -hmm. And so you just kind of see that. Invite them along on the journey. Talk about it with them. And even, you know, if you're, you're a new Jesus follower, what's great about it is you get to share your story with your kids and there's just so much there, but they just take steps and be a model with that. They don't expect you to be all the way there, but they do expect, they want to see something real and authentic in you. Yeah. Wow. I, and I think I imagine a portion of that goes into like, you mentioned like the taking steps. And so that means that like you're constantly growing you know, and mm -hmm. acknowledging that. And I think there's something cool about that process, especially if somebody is in newer where it's like, then you tangibly see, yeah, I am taking steps versus mm -hmm. I think that can probably maybe is a more challenging thing for somebody. Maybe they've been following Jesus for a long time and it feels like they're already quote doing all the things, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. how do you find times and even in that situation where it's like, okay, well, what is, what does the next step look like in that thing? And how can I continue to grow and continue to do those things? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the, one of the keys is, is once we evaluate based on our activity, then we're not evaluating well. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that we need to evaluate is on our heart and, and to have an honest look to go, is my heart growing warmer and hotter towards God or colder? And is my heart growing warmer and hotter towards people and not just church people and the people in our little circle, but people outside of that? Yeah. And is it going warmer and hotter or is it growing colder and more cynical and all that stuff? That's the starting point for really evaluating, not our activities, because you can have activities. I mean, the Pharisees in the Bible, they, they did all the right activities, but their heart was, was cold as ice. 
towards the things of God. So I think it's really just important to evaluate our heart on that and then our willingness, because a warm heart, a hot heart for God will be inspired to take steps for God. Mm -hmm. It just really I love that separator. That's so good. Cause it's like the last thing you want is for your kids to see you doing all the things, but then, you know, 10 minutes later, you're, um, treating people poorly or something like that, you know, not, well, and that's, yeah, and that's what's really know. cool is, is like, you know, you, you may lose your cool with your kids you may have done that once or twice. <laughs> <It's a parent. laughs> never, every, Mark, parent, never. <laughs> every parent's going, I never said amen before, but I'm amen in that. All right. Yeah. And you, <laughs> Okay. So that happens. And you know, this is where the, the hard thing, and then you sit down with your kids and go, man, I, Steve, I'm really sorry. And, um, uh, you know what, that I, I, I lost my cool. I lost my temper. I shouldn't have done that. That didn't honor you didn't honor God. Hey, I need, would you forgive me? Yeah. And, and it's just like, they're going like, well, wait a minute. That, that is modeling. That is a heart that's sensitive towards towards the things of God. That all that stuff is. It's just really important stuff in the midst of all that. It's just God uses that. Mm. I love that because I think that highlights a portion that you know. I I know uh, I know because I talked to them. Parents have this fear about their kids learning of their past mistakes. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes, even though they don't realize that, well, yeah, but they're seeing all the ones you're currently doing too. <laughs> um, uh, and this isn't a this isn't a ragging on parents because it's human. Everybody does that. Mm-hmm. Everyone's going to nobody responds perfectly. Uh, and I love that you talk about the how you respond in that moment is so powerful. Yeah, and I think the story thing it's really important because my kids didn't know me before. You know, when I wasn't a follower of Jesus, they didn't know that part of the story. And what's interesting is, is you can't tell that part of the story and like this, oh yeah, I was really far from God. And it was a blast, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then they're like, cause a lot of people do that. They're like, oh yeah. Okay. When, when I tell the story and tell them parts of the story, especially as it relates to different things that they were going through. And it's not like, well, when I was a kid, it's not that yeah. it was like, well, dad, you don't understand. Well, actually I do because you know, here, here's what I experienced as well. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I remember one time having a talk with them about something and I said, yeah, you know what? They're like, well, dad, you did it. I go, yeah. And you know what? I was a coward for doing it. I didn't have the courage at that point to go. I knew this was wrong and going to lead down a bad path, but I did it anyways because of this. And I regret it. And, uh, and just in, in a very humble, sincere way, talking in that sort of language that gets their attention. You know, I imagine a challenging part of this whole concept is for those parents who have maybe older kids or maybe they're in elementary school, they're in, uh, they're in high school, middle school, whatever. And all of a sudden it's like, Hey, guess what? Everybody, our priorities are shifting. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you start implementing that is, uh, yeah. I think the first thing you got to do is just have honest conversation mm-hmm. about changing you God's change in you and what the changes are going to look like moving forward and acknowledge that this may be uncomfortable mm. and this is going to be new and all that stuff. And you got, you got to have that because you got to set expectations. You don't just start doing. Mm. And from what I've seen, most kids, if you really have that conversation, are they going to push back? They always do. But if you just lovingly go back to that conversation and just say, will you just try this with me? Now, here's the thing. You're not really giving them an option. <laughs> I mean, it's not, they go, no, you're not going, well, okay, okay, okay. No, you're going, no, we're, we're going to try this as a family. Mm. And, uh, I, I just, and you just, you try it and you remain consistent and you just, you take the steps and seeds are planting. Seeds are planting. God always just plant seeds and plant seeds, but you got to have the conversation and just mm. be honest and firm about it. Yeah. That, that's what kids want. Mm. They really do. I know probably one of the most common things that it's probably a time shift. You know, I think about probably the thing that takes up most, uh, a lot of kids time right now is just activities. You Mm -hmm. know, maybe it's a sport, maybe a lot of times it's a sport, but it could be something else too. And there might have to be that hard conversation of you can't practice six or seven days. You can't practice seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Um, was there anything that you would encourage parents with on like that topic? Yeah. First off, it's, it's hard and it's getting harder. 
Yeah, it is. It's hard and it's getting harder. And it's, and, and please hear me. I'm not saying don't do sports or activities. I'm not saying that. I think that's important, but once again, we're, the research is showing part of the anxiousness of kids is from an early age. They're expected to perform mm. at all these different things. And, um, quite often. Yeah. And it's it, as natural as parents, when that begins to happen, you like, you want your kids to do well. And sometimes, you know, we don't realize that we're actually, actually making it worse by what they do and rather than giving them the, the freedom to play and be creative and just all that stuff, let them be kids for a while. Activities doesn't make a kid a kid. It just doesn't. And so you just got to be very cautious with that. We set boundaries and we looked at once again, the results of what we were seeing in culture. And we looked at all those mental health things and we looked at all those things and we took some things like parents or families that have dinner at home with their kids four times a week. And it had all these amazing statistics like their drug use drops dramatically, um, sex use drops dramatically, mental health related illnesses uh, drop dramatically. I mean, it's just all the stuff. So we said, OK, well, we're not going to compromise that. We're going to do some things. And so when we got the pressure of, hey, you need to be in baseball and it's going to be six days a week, we said, nope, not sacrificing the family. We'll do it under these boundaries. Yeah. But we're going to do this. And they're like, well, the family's going to, they're going to, the kids are going to fall behind. I'd rather have them fall behind in sports than have them get ahead in some of those statistics that we just talked about. Yeah. And, uh, and plus at the end of the day, they ain't going to be professional athletes. 99% of the kids aren't going to be professional athletes, but you know what they are going to be? They're going to be husbands and wives and parents. Uh, They're going to uh, look for purpose in their life, their identity. They're going to search for that. They're going to search for the larger things that are going to drive how they live and experience the rest of their life. And we don't think about it that way, but that's how we need to think about it. Because when kids struggle with all those things, you always go back to this. They go back to identity struggles and purpose struggles. Yeah. And, uh, and then they go back to, and when they go back to who am I, what's your answer for that? And where did I come from? And why am I here? Sports doesn't give that answer. Mm. And so I don't have a problem going, we're going to put boundaries on that because these things are foundational things that, um, are going to take root or hopefully now. So when they live on their own, man, that's just going to continue to, to, to grow. And our kids are going to thrive in the way that God's called them to thrive. Mm. I mean, you talk about having more freedom within boundaries, and I think that's a great example, right? Where all of a sudden there's less pressure, there's less time constraints, there's less every second of every day is packed, and instead there's like a breather, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, And not just, I think, not just for the kids too, but for parents as well. Well, John, that's it. I, I mean, we talk to parents all the time and they're like, oh man, my kid has this, 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 and they're just complaining about it and they're stressed. And we're, we're always like, Don and I always walk away in those conversations. Whose fault is that? Hmm. <laughs> That's what we're thinking the entire time. Yeah. You, you've allowed that to be. Yeah. And you don't have to allow that to be. But once again, it's very hard because the pressure is very hard. Yeah. So what part of, is there an element of community that makes that easier? Like, is there... Or is it like, uh, cause you talk about like the hardship and, mm-hmm. uh, I'm trying to find a way to ask it other than like, sometimes you just have to do the hard thing. You know, I'm trying to figure out, Hey, how can you equip somebody to be able to do the hard thing? Um, yeah, I, I think we always think the hard thing is the wrong thing because in the short term it feels wrong. And I talked about this in the message. We got it. Leaders. We got to model what leaders do for our kids. And we got to pick those spots. And what leaders do is they don't make decisions based on what everyone else does. In fact, really good leaders go against the grain because they see they see beyond that and they see the bigger picture of things. And so as parents, that's that's going to be part of it. And it's and it's great if you can. And this is where, you know, you're getting into a small group and all stuff, being around other parents that are committed to doing the same thing. And so you go like, am I the only one that's crazy? Because sometimes you feel that way. (laughs) If you're around other families that are like, hey, we're trying to wrestle through this as well because we want to we want to honor God. That really is important, really is helpful. And you realize, oh, we're not the only ones that are doing this. No, there's more that are trying to do this and are wrestling with this than you might realize. Well, that was part one of my conversation with Mark. Part two will be available next Tuesday, where we're going to get into the second half of Mark's goal statement. 
Now, I'd encourage anyone in the meantime to go through the process of making your own goal statement to help you in parenting. Also, you can sign up to be part of a four-week online parenting group that starts this week. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Ridge Podcast, and make sure to follow and subscribe so that you don't miss any hopeful and helpful conversations.